So this presentation is on air masses and fronts. An air mass is a large body of air with uniform physical properties. So what happens with an air mass is when air is sitting over a particular part of the earth for a period of time, it takes on the characteristics of the land or the water below it. So, um, so air masses that form over water, we call them maritime air masses, and they're moist. So if you look at this picture, the maritime polar on the left and the right, those are the darker blue ones here and here, and the maritime tropical here and here in dark red, all say that the air is moist. That means it has a lot of moisture in it. Okay, it's humid. The air masses that form over land are continental and they're dry in terms of their moisture content because obviously over land, the air is not getting the moisture that it gets when it's over water. And then finally, the last type of air mass is an Arctic air mass. And the Arctic air masses are the ones when we get that polar vortex they talk about in the winter when it's really, really, really super cold, like less than, less than freezing, less than zero Celsius or 32 um, Fahrenheit. That's when we're getting air from the North Pole, the continental Arctic air. And that's that really, really cold air that we get sometimes. For the most part, though, the air masses that we're going to be having around here are going to be these maritime polar air masses or the continental polar. Um, those are going to give us um, some of our characteristics and the maritime tropical and the continental tropical. So if it's continental, it's going to be dry, okay, over land. If it's maritime, it's going to be moist because it forms over water. If it comes from the southern part of the northern hemisphere, that is by the equator, it's going to be um, tropical, which means the air is going to be warm. And if it comes from Canada, from the north, um, it means it's going to be polar and the air is going to be cool. So if we kind of forget about continental Arctic, because that's really not one that happens a lot for us, for the most part, our choices are cool and moist or cool and dry if it's coming from the north and warm and moist and warm or hot and dry if it's coming from the south for us in the northern hemisphere, because the south is closer to the equator. So fronts are sharply defined boundaries that form when two unlike air masses meet. So when you have that um, boundary between, say, a um, cool, moist air mass and a um, warm, dry air mass, that's going to be a front. We often get clouds and precipitation at fronts. And there's four types of fronts, a warm front, a cold front, a stationary front, and an occluded front. A warm front is the first one we're going to look at. So here on the left, we have warm air, okay, that's moving in this direction. This is cold air here. When the warm air comes in, comes in kind of slowly, okay, and we get clouds that develop like this at the slow moving front with this nice, even, kind of shallow slope. So think about what you've learned about clouds so far. What kind of clouds are going to kind of be low clouds with kind of, you know, this layered kind of look? Probably stratus clouds. Okay, so a warm front is going to have um, Stratus clouds. Oh, look, I have it down here at the bottom. <laughs> and steady rain. Okay. The symbol that we write for a warm front are these round half circles. 
okay? The circles are always going in the direction of the front, so you can tell the front is moving in this direction because these circles are going this way. And I always think of them as like drops of sweat. So that's how I think that it's a warm front. I remember it's a warm front because they're round like drops of sweat. The next front we're going to look at is a cold front. So again, the front's still moving here from left to right. But it looks a lot different, doesn't it? First of all, a cold front is going to be moving a lot faster than a warm front is, just because that's what they do. Um, so here's the cold air. It's moving this way, but since cold air is more dense than warm air, the cold air stays down closer to the ground. Okay, So you get this more steep slope here where the cold air is hitting the warm air. That means that your clouds are going to form higher up okay because um because of the slope of the air the symbol for the cold front are these pointy things i think of them as icicles okay and again they're pointing in the direction the cold front is moving so this cold front is going to have a steeper slope whoops cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds so what kind of um, weather is that going to give you? It's not going to give you um, steady light rain like stratus clouds will give you. It's going to give you lots of precipitation, um, short duration but really heavy, stronger winds, um, maybe thunderstorms. Okay, those are the conditions you're going to get um, with a cold front coming through. And of course the temperature is going to be lower as well once the cold front comes through. But a cold front just doesn't happen in the winter. A cold front could happen in the summer when the, um, when the warm air is, say, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And the cold front is, say, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not like it has to be cold. It just has to be colder than the air that it's replacing. So a stationary front is when two unlike air masses meet, okay, but neither one is moving. So for some reason, um, that cold front or that warm front doesn't have the momentum that it had before. And so if you look here, a stationary front is down here in Texas. And we write the symbol, oh, it's kind of hard to see. We write the symbol um, with the cold front going in one direction and the warm front going in the other because what was happening is this i'll do this in red this warm front was moving northward okay the cold front was moving southward and instead of one overtaking the other they just kind of stay still um, and so whatever weather conditions that you have there you're going to have for a prolonged period of time so if you have um, if you have weather where for a couple of days or even for a week you have just like steady rain or steady snow, that's probably a stationary front that's going on, and those um, and those conditions of precipitation are going to remain for a few days. And finally, the last type of front is an occluded front. So the occluded front is the most confusing. First of all, let's start by looking at the symbol, because the symbol looks similar to the symbol for a stationary front, except what's the difference? Both symbols are going in the same direction. See that? So both fronts are moving in the same direction. In a stationary front, the warm front was going in one direction and the cold front was going in another. In an occluded front, they're both going in the same direction. So what's really happening here? So there was a mass, a cold air mass here, okay? And before this was here, a warm air mass was coming through. So a warm air mass came through, and here you can see the line that you have that, that slope, steady slope line of a warm air mass. The warm air mass came through. But like I said before, the warm air mass is kind of slow. It kind of takes its time. It comes in slowly, but behind that warm air mass was a really fast cold air mass, okay? 
So what happened is the cold air mass kind of overtook the warm air mass and pushed the warm air up. And now you have a boundary where the two cold air masses meet right here. So here's cold, okay? Here's colder. And here's warm, pushed up here now. Okay, because cold air, again, I keep saying this over and over again, cold air is more dense than warm air. So cold air is going to stay closer to the ground, and the warm air, which is less dense, is going to get pushed up. Okay, so you're going to have clouds and precipitation here at an occluded front. Um, usually, though, this cold air mass is moving in pretty quickly, so it should clear out a lot faster than it would with a stationary front. So the last part of this presentation is on air pressure. So air pressure is the force of air pushing on the surface of the earth. Um, air is pushing on us all the time, but we don't feel it just because we're used to it. We've been experiencing it our whole lives. If you go into outer space, there is um, much less air pressure, so you won't feel it. And that's when you'll notice the difference before when you come um, when you come back down to earth. That's when you'll notice the difference. Um, that we do have air pressure here on Earth. So are there, there are two types of pressure systems. There's the H, which is high pressure system, and there's L, which is low pressure. So here's a high pressure system right here. What do you notice about fronts um, where the high pressure system is? Well, when I look at it, I see there's no front boundaries, okay? Um, there's no boundaries between air masses where that high pressure system is. So that's going to be nice, clear weather, okay? I don't know if it's cold or hot, but I know that the skies are clear and it's not raining. No precipitation. Here, where the low pressure systems are, what's going on? That's where you have your frontal boundaries. So that's where you're going to have some kind of precipitation, snow or rain, clouds, whether they're cumulus or stratus okay are going to happen by low pressure systems high pressure systems are not going to have any um any clouds or precipitation and think about when you did the condensation activity with the sponge when you squeeze that sponge out that's like something being under a cloud or the air being under high pressure and when you squeeze the sponge out all the water came out of it and then it was dry and that's what a high pressure system is like all that air is dry. All the moisture that was in it has been squeezed out. And so it's a nice, dry, clear sky. As opposed to a low pressure system, that's like when you put the sponge in the water and you lifted it up and it was dripping because it was full and there wasn't a lot of pressure on it. That's what a low pressure system is like, clouds and precipitation. And so a low pressure system is officially called a cyclone which I know is kind of um, a strange word because we usually think of cyclones as storms. But if you think about it, it is kind of logical because a low pressure system is when you are going to have storms, right? That's when you're going to have clouds and rain. Maybe not intense storms like we might think of as cyclones. A lot of times we think of a cyclone as a tornado and it's not, okay? A cyclone, a low pressure system can turn into a tornado but they are not one and the same, okay? Um, the difference, the big difference um, in terms of meteorology between a low pressure system and a high pressure system, of course, besides the change in pressure, is the way the air moves. So in a low pressure system, air is, is coming in towards the center. It circles counterclockwise. So if you put your hand in front of you and you spin it around and around and around, it's going against a clock that's going from left to right. Okay, um, an anticyclone is the official name for a high pressure system, which is good weather. And the air is moving away from the center, so it circles clockwise. So you put your hand in front of you again and you spin it, you're going to spin it like a clock from right to left. 
Um, and in a high pressure system, an anticyclone, we have clear skies, not much precipitation, calm conditions, beautiful weather. Um, but a low pressure system that air spirals into the center um, can result in a hurricane or a tornado. Okay. And, um, and it does start out with clouds, precipitation, and stormy weather. So that is it for air masses, fronts, and pressure systems.